I'm not going to fall out with anybody and I hope I haven't fallen out with anybody. There's, I, as you said, there's a lot of silent people out there who never took a side or maybe they did, but didn't want to say it in public. And some people might've found it hard to take a side, I suppose, but, and that's fine. Like, you know, I said, even when, when we won our case in the end, it was important that we weren't jumping from the rooftops and saying, ha ha ha, now look what, or any of that stuff, you know, a bit of dignity in defeat and in victory, I suppose. Hello and welcome to the Southern Stars Coronavirus Podcast. I'm the news editor, Siobhan Cronin, and this week's interview is with Skibbereen man Brendan McCarthy. It is now a year since SOS, the Save Our Skibbereen group, was successful in its bid to halt the construction of a plastics factory in the town. I spoke earlier to Brendan, a campaigner, a teacher, and chair of the local arts festival, about the SOS campaign, some interesting environmental plans for the town, and how COVID has impacted on West Cork schools and the festival circuit. So Brendan, we're just after celebrating the one year mark after you heard the good news that the plastics factory was no longer going ahead in Skibbereen as a result of your very active campaign for the previous few years. So for those who wouldn't be that familiar with it, can you just bring us back there to the start of the campaign and how you got involved and what, what it involved? Yeah, um, I suppose at the start was kind of March, April 2017, uh, during the Easter holidays that year, myself and my wife, who's from Normandy, and our children, four of them, we were over in France for a week or so during the Easter holidays from school. And my mother and father lived just down the road. And my mother rang me one of the days to say there was a, a gathering of neighbours outside my house talking about this planning notice that had gone up in the previous few days for a plastics factory to be built in the field right across the road from my house. Um, myself and my neighbour here would be the nearest two houses to it. And there was a discussion out on the road as to as much information as was there at the time about it and stuff and letting everyone know as well. Um, so I came back from France a few days later and kind of got stuck into reading the file in the council in uh, Norton House, the planning office. And kind of as was making myself more aware of it and what needed, we had about a month then to get an observation in by the end of that May. And so all the neighbours on the road did. There's about 15 of us living on this road, which runs parallel kind of to the Baltimore Road behind the IDA site and the Baltimore Road. Um, so the entrance was going to be off the Baltimore Road, but it was right up against our little rural road at the back. Um, so we were all kind of, we met a couple of more times in the intervening four or five weeks, getting our information together, what were the points, what were the concerns. We weren't just objecting for the sake of objecting or I'd never objected to anything in my life. Um, but I think there was enough grounds for concern for us all. And I kind of raised awareness a bit in the road opposite, like that would be looking down at the factory from Compass Hill, it's called, it goes from the Baltimore Road up and comes out at the new cemetery. And a lot of houses up there would have been looking straight down at the factory. And so I did up a bit of information and dropped it to the houses up that road. And in the end, there was about 37 ob observers, as they're called now, used to be objections, that went in just voicing concerns. and. If you didn't have an observation in, you, you couldn't have any right to appeal or anything down the line. So we put in our concerns in time and it was kind of just wait and see. I think like te technically the council have four weeks to decide. And at the end of the four weeks, they came back looking for further information from the company and their um, consultants. So they had six months then. So it kind of stayed still for a while. And then that took us up to November. I remember it was Black Friday was, was the deadline day. And I have a friend of mine in the planning office and I play music with him and stuff. And he said to me the previous Sunday while we were playing music, he said, I'd ask him every so often. And he said, no, we hadn't heard anything back from that company or that um, planning application. They were kind of thinking maybe they've just gone away kind of thing. And then lo and behold, two hours before the deadline, they submitted the further information on Black Friday at the end of November. Um, and then the council a month later, just before Christmas, <clears throat> granted the planning okay so, so that, that's was, that when, was the first yeah yeah that's when things then really took a, a turn i suppose and um you really upped the campaign after that and there was 
I think one particular meeting in the West Cork Hotel, um, I think some of the early meetings were quite, quite poorly attended, but there was one particular meeting where it was absolutely jam-packed. It was standing room only. Do you remember that meeting? Yeah, that was a year later. So I suppose we had two, two kind of Christmases in a row where we got bad news, I suppose. Um, that first Christmas, 2017, just before Christmas, we got, as I said, the, the council granted the planning permission, which was kind of a bit of a realization and for us all that look, we're up against something big here kind of thing. Um, I know, the, uh, sorry, was I was gonna say, there was a second, we arranged meetings after. The second Christmas sorry. then, you got, you got bad news the then in relation. Yeah, just after that Christmas there, the first one, um, we kind of, I, from talking to people around the place, there was a lot of people just didn't know anything about it. So as well as getting our appeal in order, like any of the 37 or eight different observers could appeal it, but there was no point in all of us appealing it. So we, we kind of clubbed together and went with one appeal, but as well as putting in the appeal, I wanted to kind of raise awareness in the community that this wasn't just an issue for us here living in the adjacent immediate vicinity of the site. It was a bigger thing for Skibbereen and for the wider area. So we called a meeting early January, that's 2018. And there's a handy crowd out of 50 or 60 people. And I just outlined a kind of summary of the main concerns. And again, word began to spread gradually from that. We got our appeal in. Again, on board Planola, it just dragged on and on and on and on. It, there was the deadline that they were supposed to decide passed. And then they gave another deadline that passed. And then they didn't have to give another deadline. So it was just kind of ring every week and see is there any updates, which I did eventually to the end of that year, late November, again, they, and Board Planola came back saying that they had um, upheld the council decision. And <clears throat> I suppose that was really kind of starting point that realization among the wider community because they went against their own inspector who had recommended that <clears throat> the grant planning was would be premature on this right now because of this and this and this. One of the grounds he mentioned was public health concerns. So we arranged a public meeting. We had had a couple of other, other public meetings in the intervening months and we've been doing loads of research we got some great people involved in the campaign and then yeah the public meeting you, you referred to was i think the 18th of december in the west park hotel like um it got great coverage on the southern star the previous thursday and yeah i i i was in the town council for 10 years myself and i've you know from a business family in skibbereen i'd never seen such a crowd at a meeting in the west park hotel a public meeting and like i was in there early getting ready but people said as they as they were coming down the street, there was like a river of people walking down Island Street and cars all over the place coming to the West Park. And they were there from all over the place. And I think we were very heartened by that then, knowing that we had big support in the community. Yeah. But were you also surprised at the kind of flip-flopping of some politicians? And I know you're a former councillor yourself, <laughs> but um, there were some people who had uh, supported it when it had at council level and then when they kind of saw I think the huge support yeah. for your campaign there was a bit of backtracking um, even on the night and um, yeah is that something that you know surprised yourselves even that the it seems to be almost unanimous support at that stage yeah I suppose pleasantly surprised maybe yeah because we had all kind of put our feeders out to the local councillors and public reps before that meeting about um this is what our thoughts were, this is our concerns, etc. And yeah, like you said, it was unanimously passed at the change of the zoning, the material contravention to the development plan. And the councillors who voted yes that day, a lot of them did change their mind and come to our side then. And maybe it was when they saw the grounds for the support. But as I said that night in the West Cork, look, anyone is entitled to change their mind, elected rep or not. And I was delighted that lots of them did and lots of them kind of have been very supportive since and stuff. And some of them who weren't in the council at the time of the zoning, they were supportive of us. And, you know, as well, I suppose it's worth saying that there was a couple of councillors, maybe one particular who didn't change his mind and stuck to his guns. And, you know, fair play to him for that, I suppose. We mightn't have agreed, but, but you know, that wasn't, that's... it would have been easy to change your mind, I suppose. Absolutely, and that I think um, there's no there's no um, 
uh, there's no surprise, it's, it's Councillor Joe Carroll, the Feet of Law Councillor from the area, I think you're referring to there. And Joe, I think, has no problem because he's always been very forthright saying that he did uh, feel that, that that factory should have come to Skibbereen. And he was talking from a jobs, jobs point of view. And there was a certain feel in the community, I think, from what I gathered myself, there was a kind of a silent minority who just wanted jobs because they had maybe kids living abroad, you know, the area's been ravaged yeah. by emigration twice in the last few decades. So I suppose there was an, there was an argument there too that it needed needed to be aired, you know, that it, there was a, a, a feel that maybe jobs should be brought to the town. But of course, your argument was jobs, but at what cost and long term yeah, exactly. may have, have been yeah. more um, damaging to the jobs in the area, especially tourism jobs. Yeah, definitely. Like, and <clears throat> I remember growing up behind the first and second factories there's Starball and Spire Lux as it was at the time and <clears throat> there was loads of jobs and Denpec which was the most recently developed unit in 82 there was loads of jobs on those sites but like this factory realistically we were talking about 15 to 20 jobs and for the size of the structure and all the concerns that were there with it we just I and we didn't feel that it was it was worth those 15 jobs, you know, it would be at the detriment of lots of other jobs in the area. And especially when you see like Skibbereen and I still even think about how much Skibbereen has come on in the last few years with all the different things like with brand new state of the art community school, brilliant sewerage scheme done in recent times, the flood defense scheme, which was, you know, some people don't agree with it. It's not the most pretty thing to look at, but it saved the town. A few weeks ago, <clears throat> apart from the Bridge Street, residents and businesses, which wasn't directly part of the defences scheme. That was a different issue. So, and, you know, we've got um, loads of positives. That's on the job side, we've got Ludgate, we've got Spearline, we've got, you know, again, a, a recent planning application for the old convent site in Skibreen to be done up. All of these creating lots of jobs using ex existing buildings, not loads of traffic in and out of trucks and stuff, you know. But every time, uh, every time I was on the local radio or the local press or anything, there was always a couple of phone calls came in. What about the jobs? And they're only looking at it's a um, nimbyism and this kind of stuff was thrown at us. But you know, you'll have that, I suppose. Um, as I said, before, I was never involved in any kind of a campaign like this before, and it was very eye-opening. But I think it was very important to stay from the start and to the end. Like I, I meet Joe Carroll and I can still have a chat with him. And he was in the council with me for five years. His daughter, Linda, was in the council with me for five years. And I've known Joe Carroll driving the bus and stuff since I was a kid. And he's an old character from town and all that. We, we differed on this matter, but I'm not going to fall out with anybody. And I hope I haven't fallen out with anybody. There's, I, as you said, there's a lot of silent people out there who never took a side. Or maybe they did, but didn't want to say it in public. And some people might have found it hard to take a side, I suppose. But... And that's fine, like, you know, I said, even when, when we won our case in the end, it was important that we weren't jumping from the rooftops and saying, ha, 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 no, look, what, or any of that stuff, you know, a bit of dignity and defeat and in victory, I suppose. I know, well, I, and I think you pushed, you know, the argument that now is the time to, um, you know, have a very strong green agenda and the whole sustainability idea is very strong. And with that does come jobs as well down the line. So it's kind of a long-term view you were taking. But also, yeah. um, like you had two very good uh, victories there. Um, so for people who, who don't who don't know what happened next, what happened next was that it went back to a board yeah. Nola and they decided that the original planning commission should be quashed. And then a few weeks later, I think we went, that was at the High Court. Yeah, at, at um, Court. And after on board Planola granted planning yeah. at the end of 2018, <clears throat> our only course of action then was a judicial review. And again, they don't come cheap and looking in West Cork at the time or Cork County at the time there was like six or eight different judicial reviews happening and each of those groups having to fundraise to raise funds to take it to judicial reviews some of them you, you could be talking hundreds or hundreds of thousands of euros and we didn't have it and like here we were at the beginning of January looking to raise that money but at that meeting in December our target initially was 15,000 which was what having discussed it with legal people you'd want about that to get <clears throat> That's the first, um, yeah, to get into the court <clears throat> system and get into the judicial review. <clears throat> so we said that at that meeting and 
at the end of that meeting, just afterward, we had already been pledged. What was what was made in the room was about three and a half thousand in baskets at the back of the room, and we had a pledge of another seven and a half thousand. And the money just kept coming in online that night, and like it was amazing, really, to think that 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 level of support and different fundraisers happened in Baltimore and Skull and Clan and people recorded a CD, people recorded a track and it was put together into a CD. We'd stall at the market, raise the awareness and you know, there was donations from 2,000 to two euros and it all went and we made about 40,000 over a couple of months there, which <clears throat> is a hard couple of months every year for trying to raise money. And you're taking it out of a community that, you know, is asked to donate to other causes and stuff at the same time. But so we were into the judicial review system. We we got over the first hurdle, which was yes, you do merit getting into judicial review. And then it was kind of delaying again, toing and froing. It was there supposed to be for mention on the floor of the High Court at different dates. And as always happens, the dates kind of come and go. Um, and then in July of that year, we got an inkling from our solicitor in Dublin that there was an issue. There was one of the <clears throat> one of the criteria that we were our main four clauses. One of them, yeah, that they couldn't get over it, and so the judge was quashing it. He was quashing the order of Ambor Planala from the previous November. So that was July. So yes, that was a huge. That was our first victory on the road, kind of thing, after a couple of knockbacks. Um, but then the, the door was still open for them to to kind of rectify that issue and, and come back into the court system. They wouldn't have had to go back to the very start of a planning application. And then in September, on a Monday in September, I, I was teaching music and I'd come home from school and barely time for a cup of tea and back out to teach music for a few hours. And there was a letter in my letterbox from Ambor Planala saying that the company had decided not to take this any further. So that was, that was the end of the, of, the end. yeah. Of a very long yeah, so. and um, emotional campaign oh, for you all. Yeah, and that's that's what we're celebrating the first anniversary of now. But I was thinking, like other campaigns, like the campaign again against the yeah. incinerator in Cork, for example. That that's going on for twenty years. Like mm. we were two years, two and a half years, and it was fairly full on for the two and a half years. But like there's there's kids, there's twenty year olds around during a skid, you know, who weren't even born when that campaign started. And, Thanks be to God, we weren't involved for that long yeah. of a campaign. I was saying to myself, but you had some. We get our life um, back. You had some very good, high-profile supporters as well. I think you had David Putnam came on board, um, Jeremy Irons came on board, um, and yeah. I think they they spoke at meetings as well. So I mean, I suppose all that helped. Maybe some people who were sitting on the fence. Maybe some some of those great speeches might have brought them along with you. You know. Yeah, definitely. It would have influenced and would have helped us in terms of getting coverage, like nationally and locally as well. Like we and got great coverage. As well, you know, and that you were and able fundraising, to make yeah. review. So, Brendan, yeah. you, you have a bit of a war chest now built up because luckily you didn't need all the money that was fundraised. So you announced nope. in the paper <laughs> last week um, that you had a, a great idea for the rest of the money. So tell us a bit about that. Yeah. So after... What we had spent, like uh, as well as as quashing the order on board, or the High Court awarded us costs on board Planala to pay our costs. So what we had spent was about thirteen thousand at the time. We got almost to the penny. We got that back. So we had obviously spent a certain amount of money on different expenses over the time, but we have about thirty thousand now in our account, and we had said all the time that we would, you know. Different questions were asked at the start when we were setting up our company. What would happen if we won to potentially, if we had, say, fundraised 50 or 100,000, what would happen to the money? Looking at both sides, we could have lost it, obviously, as well. And we'd need more money, maybe, if the further the thing went on. But it was hard to think of one thing, like um, different people have suggested, oh, we should give it to this campaign or that campaign. but. It was very hard to do that because it was it was given to this campaign. Someone who was in favour of this campaign might not. We couldn't assume they were in favour of another campaign. Um, some people mentioned educational initiatives donated to UCC environment department. Or, you know, some. So we said something in keeping with what it was raised for, and we did go back to kind of the major donors and stuff and asked, did they want their money back? And like no one said to me in the whole twelve months 
what's happening to the money or mm-hmm. when can I get my money back? I think, and I, and the overwhelming feeling was people donated to this. And we got what we donated for. We got the dream results kind of thing. And it wasn't, I'm giving you this 20 quid. I want it back if you win kind of thing. It was, yes, we won. Um, so we did say, look, we try and give it back to the community. It wasn't me. I was the named appellant in the case. It wasn't me. It wasn't SOS. It was a big chunk of this community here locally in Skibreen and in West Cork who had won this campaign. And I think it's very fitting that we said, look, we'll put 20 of the 30 into a chest or a, a fund at the moment and call it fund 2020 fund. And we invited applications last week to submit applications to us. And if there's a, uh, a project in mind, it can be smaller or a larger project that, you know, kind of in keeping, I suppose, with the ethos of what the fundraising was, what the money was raised for. And you're, you're talking about sustainability? The money we would, yeah, yes, but not just for environmental causes either. Do you know, if there was a, an, a worthy project in a school or that they wanted to do something, but, but that there would be, I suppose, something to show at the end of it and to show that we, as a group, were not just objectors objecting to a plastic factory, that we're, there's a bigger picture than that. Like you mentioned, the sustainability, like there's a, a couple of different groups have come into being now in Skibreen, I think, as a result of our campaign. There's a green Skibreen and there's a sustainable Skibreen. And even the Skibreen tidy towns are every year doing brilliant work and stuff. If they had a project in mind, by all means, like we're not dismissing any project now. We're, we're welcoming any project to come in. It's Skibreen, I suppose, and it's wider area, like as that's the, where the money was raised. But that we'd look at every project we, until the 30th of October, which is a Friday, is the deadline for application. So it's five more weeks. And then six weeks after that, we'll hopefully be awarding the 20,000. We said um, it can be from 500 to 5,000. And we'll see how many come in. And then we might have to give less because we want to give to more groups and stuff like that. But mm. I'd hope that there will be a good selection of applications come in. And what's um, the geographical for a lot of area, projects. Brendan? What's what's the um, border borderline for the project? Geographical, is mm-hmm. it? Well, I suppose, uh, yeah, like from Skull to Clannacilty, maybe ish that kind of right. Okay, area. so it's not set like in stone. No, it depends on the project, I suppose. No. Yeah. yeah, and depends on the number of projects that come in and stuff. But I think it's good to keep it at or cap it at five grand. You know, if there's an excellent project comes in and they get 5,000 and then maybe next year we look at what comes in this year and mm. look at what to do then with the remaining 10. Like if a project needs another 2,000 to just get it That's to really right. fruition, we'd look at that again kind of thing. Yeah, but that there would be something I suppose to show at the end of it. And it'd be great, I think, that the community gets the money back. Like one example now was the local luncheon club, the Geriatric Society, who... Do, or did the last couple of years, did a kind of a climb. They climbed Karen Tool the first year and they climbed, um, what's the name of the mountain over there? Beyond Ballylicky there. I actually did the climb myself. And Not it was Hungry a Hill, brilliant day it? out and stuff. Not Hungry Hill, it was supposed to be Hungry Hill, but that kind of, it was too, the conditions weren't conducive on the day. Um, it was near the Priest Leap. And I'd never been there before. It was stunning scenery and with a couple of guides with us and people of all ages and great just social occasion as well as doing the climb. Um, but half of what was raised were going to the luncheon club and half to SOS. And so they gave us 1100 euros. And then during the summer, the height of this pandemic, we gave them back the 11 plus a bit with it. So we gave them back 1500. When they had, they were crying out for more money from their meals on wheels, like with COVID and restrictions and all that, they couldn't actually take the money from the people who benefiting from the wheel, meals and wheels. So that was just something small that we did for them. We gave them back their money at, when they needed it. And that's, I suppose, the idea of, of this. That's lots of groups. Yeah, lots of groups need the money now. And yeah. it's not our money to give, but, you know, it's great to be able to give. But there's yeah. keep, keep a similar ethos, I think, in, in, the, in the handouts. Um, yeah. So, like someone said to me last week, for the, I'm thinking of building a little unit there producing plastic. <laughs> Could we apply <laughs> to the fund? <laughs> PPE maybe. It's in big demand at the moment. So, <laughs> so um, yeah. Brenton, where, where do people, if they want to send in an idea, what's the email address or website? Yeah, the email address is 
fund 2020 2020 at saveorskibreen.ie and all the information is there on Save Our Skibreen <coughs> website and Facebook page and social media outlets and in last week's Southern Star, of course. It's okay. Now, just <laughs> we're wearing your other hat, maybe we just might talk for a little bit about, um, this is the coronavirus podcast, so a little bit about <laughs> how you have found getting back into the classroom because you're a principal out in Union Hall and um, you're back yeah. now, what is it, two, three weeks, two weeks? we're nearly fin nearly four weeks back Lord. and yeah that's time that's, is flying i suppose <laughs> i know absolutely it is flying yeah some days it's flying and then other days you're saying jesus it seems like ages ago that it was only tuesday um yeah but definitely and through it all this sos my main hat is that i'm principal of union hall national school for nearly 11 years and a teaching principal as well which isn't easy at the best of times but now it's a completely different job and when when we closed on the 12th of march it was kind of you know it was surreal kind of have, just telling the kids that we're closing for the next two weeks and we kind of knew at the time it would be five weeks because mm -hmm. there was a week then and then there was easter for two weeks and we didn't know at the time i suppose that it would have been for <laughs> we wouldn't be back till september mm -hmm. and it's so that was that was different and that was a struggle, the remote learning and setting work and some kids engaged with it better than others. And it was understandable, you know, the weather was brilliant. Kids were out doing lots of other things, learning. There's all kinds of learning. Um, and then coming with September in mind and the <clears throat> realization, yes, we were going back and that was the main objective of the government. It was kind of full on for the month of August and even before it for some schools getting ready. And I suppose the same as any stage of the plan when businesses were to reopen there was a lot of stress and a lot of anticipation and anxiety about but i think that the, there was way too much talk in the national airwaves about what is going to happen when the schools open and what happens if this happens and what happens if that happens and, and were you so working to actually away in get the, open were you working away in the background now all summer getting your you know i don't know yeah uh, we were lucky in our school because that that, um, you don't have to do social distancing as such with the kids in primary but you yeah in primary school of, um, sanitizing you know and and the yeah. teachers i presume and we had like, trained and pp were and we all got that. um we got new windows and doors in the school last summer and new floors in three of the classrooms and we actually have four classrooms like the year before that i had three classes in my room with 36 kids last year i had two classes with 22 kids so it's a lot easier with two classes in the room. There's some local schools have four classes in a room and they're mm -hmm. smaller schools. Like we were lucky that way. I kind of knew at the start, we would not have to do major building works to get ready for this. <clears throat> but of course, like you're done with the measuring tape and measuring out, I have 28 kids in my class this year and like you have them a meter apart or two meters apart if you can, but we can't. So you have them in pods. So each class is a bubble and I have five pods in my classroom so there's six kids at a desk, a meter in any direction from that desk. There's another six. So what age group are they, Brendan? They're fifth and sixth class, so they're okay, kind of so 10, 11 bit, and 12 year olds. A yeah, little bit easier to sister. herd around than the toddlers with the, the four or five year olds. Yeah, yeah. And it was good that they said that they don't expect junior infants to second class to social distance as much, mm. but they, they are still in bubbles. And I suppose there's, it's, it's full on, like there's no break in the day. Now we have four classrooms, as I said. So my class and the infant room go out with two yards. So one class in each yard. And then when we come back in, the other two classes go out. So like teaching, a lot of people said she's teaching a great job, but there's, it was always kind of not the most social job because you wouldn't meet too many adults during the course of your day. Whereas now it's <laughs> you don't meet anyway of If you're if you're not on duty in the yard, you're you're Billy No mates inside, have your cup of tea on your own in the staff room or in the hall or wherever you are. And time just flies, I think, and mm. you're spending a lot of time with, with your bubble. And I suppose the bubbles aren't allowed to mix, they're not supposed to mix from once they come in the gate in the morning till they go out at three o'clock. But sure then you go home yourself and you, they're all hanging out together down the village and stuff. Mm. But I think, look, we're very lucky around here, and I've said it all the time, that we're living where we're living. We have plenty of space. We have nice little country roads. Or like Union Hall is a beautiful place, like on the sea, beaches, woodlands. There's no huge volume of traffic driving past. And, and the kids have been mixing since they were allowed to mix there back in May. 
and there hasn't been any case in Unihall, touch wood. But again, you have to kind of remind them and there's more hand washing. We all wash our hands when we come in first thing and you're sanitizing loads of times every day. And I had just every time to, you don't want complacency to set in, like I said, on, on Monday morning when you saw the rise of cases around the country that, you know, just because we've been hanging out together all summer doesn't mean that we can't get it or that it's not going to affect us kind of thing. It's not just a Dublin issue. It's not just a city issue. It's, so it's, it's definitely very different and it's kind of full on. And, but at the same time, it's great. And I think the parents, the kids and the teachers and staff are all just delighted. And even other people passing, like I remember the first couple of days, they were saying it's so great to hear the noise again, you know, mm, the voice to see in the, the, in the, see the cars outside the school. And yeah. yeah, the buzz of the schoolyard, exactly. And can I just ask you, so um, your other hat is the chair of the Arts Festival. So um, how, how has that gone this year? I, it was very much um, reduced, I think. And did you go ahead with yeah, your theatre element in the town hall in Skibbereen? Yeah, I have a lot of hats, Siobhan. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Put on the, the third arts, one there now. The arts, <laughs> The arts definitely, it's been, I think, if not the most affected area, it's definitely certainly one of the most affected areas in the whole of this. And it's still very hard to know when, when are we going to get back to having a full town hall in Skibreen or every story church or having a street party in Bridge Street with a thousand people at it and stuff. So we kind of had decided we, after waiting and waiting that look, our traditional time for this arts festival, and this was the 12th one of them, um, is the last week of July running up to and including the August weekend. And we kind of said, look, that's out. But then the more we thought of it, the Arts Council and Fairness have been very supportive and they've kind of said, look, the money is there. Don't don't um, dismiss it now if you want to do something later on in the year. They're very supportive of the artists and arts organizations. And so it was kind of, we decided to have it the first weekend of September because I was just back in school. I kind of said, I'm not really going to be I can't be hands-on. It would look very bad if I was in the town hall and brought a case or was a con co close contact or something and I just opening back in school. So I only went to one of the nights myself. I went the first night and it was um, Steve Cooney and Dermot Byrne. But my brother Declan, who's been kind of our festival manager the last number of years, he kind of ran it himself this year. But the reaction was amazing to it. Um, we had three concerts and a couple, a few plays in the town hall and skip that was the only venue we used um so thursday friday saturday and sunday night and there was a couple of lunchtime plays as well and we got a lovely mural done down at the side of brian harris's wall on the way from the bridge into the art center and there was a couple of small little art exhibits around the town as well um but like the capacity in the town hall was 44 people whereas normally it'd be about 244 mm. and last year you know, we had the Blind Boys of Alabama did two shows in there. We've had Roseanne Cash in the recent past. We've had a um, great tribute night to the two lads in Skull, Fergus O'Farrell, and amazing artists and stuff over the last few years. But even to, to be one of the 44 in the town hall, there was a great atmosphere. People were just delighted to see a bit of live music, live theatre, live entertainment again. And... No, we did it right. Everyone came in with their masks on and we all sat at the two metre distance. Mm. But it was great just to just to see a bit of live entertainment back again. And we're thinking hopefully, depending what happens in the next few months, that we might do something small again a couple of nights between Christmas and the New Year. I think people just so much are missing the live well, music. And yeah. yeah. Even if it's a small like crowd, no just, just to be able to get out yeah. and, and, and mix oh, distance. Yeah, yeah. Or not, yes. yeah. Even that and mural, it just it's, it says there is a light, and so I think it's very important that we called it a ray of light. Mm. That there is this won't be here forever, and you know, some days you think that oh God, is this ever going to stop? But there is a light at the end of every tunnel. Exactly. And yeah. uh, just to, finally, then Brendan, uh, I know you're a big music fan yourself. I think you play the banjo, and um, I've, I've been asking everyone to recommend something that they came across during the last few months that kind of cheered them up so was there a piece of music or a music documentary or anything that um that kind of brought um, that light that light for you yeah like playing music i suppose normally in the summertime i'd have been 
playing maybe four or five sessions a week in a couple of local places and but of course that didn't happen I, I played three times <clears throat> in the last six months um we did a lovely I think just myself and the fellow who plays with me just we were sitting on the decking outside my own house here um and it was a beautiful sunny morning just after the june weekend because there was a every year there'd be a walk in trag for a local girl who passed away a few years ago eilish collins who was big into music and big into the community in Castlehaven and um, Tragumna being the local and her dad John Joe was a great box bear and he had actually passed away last November and we just um, it was kind of done online this year that local kids and local people just took photos of themselves out walking and stuff so we played a song that morning in remembering those two people and another one just last Saturday night we um, my youngest son was 11 back in August and we bought him an online ticket for Christy Moore live at the concert hall, which was on last Saturday night. And it was brilliant. Like mm. there was no gap between the songs kind of thing. It was full on, but it was mm. kind of surreal. Obviously you're looking kind of from behind his head at this huge space and no one in it, but it kind of showed again, I think. And I think the Cork Folks Festival are doing it in a couple of weeks time where they're having people playing in the opera house to no one, but it's being streamed. Mm. Do you know, like I said, 44 people in the town hall, there is, ways i suppose of, like the atmosphere obviously would be different but there is ways of of helping the artists and yeah i suppose that that, that christy morning would have been one of the highlights definitely great brilliant well listen brendan thanks so much for joining us and best of luck with the campaign and as you said yourself if anyone wants to find out more about that or uh indeed the other um projects you're involved in have a look at the save our skibbereen website so thanks yep. very much brendan. exactly thanks, thanks very much, Siobhan. Thank you. And so to this week's newspaper. Our lead story is about the reopening of the pubs, but also the news that a few of them are not reopening. Publican William O'Brien of the Corner Bar in Skibbereen tells us that he is adopting a wait-and-see approach, as a bar without a counter has no atmosphere and no enjoyment. Our headline on that story is Pulling Power. We also cover the story of the nuns from LEP, who have fallen foul of the County Council's planning department, having erected a number of garden sheds to live, cook and worship in at their hermitage at Lep, just outside Skibbereen. The nun who was brought to court, Sister Irene, pleaded for more time to find alternative accommodation and Judge McNulty gave her until next June, when the case will be heard in court again. Inside we have a number of court cases, including a case involving a dairy farmer from Belgooley, who was also a councillor's son, and he was given time to uh, he was given jail time on a charge of having cocaine for sale and supply. And in another drugs case, abandoned man solicitor denied guard the claims that his client was a member of an organised drugs and crime gang in West Cork. We also have the sobering news that Cork County Council will have a 19 million euro hold th- this year in its budget as a result of COVID expenditure and the fall off in business rates, with so many businesses closed during the pandemic. We also hear that the recent flooding cost the council five million euro in road repairs. We learn that a fish producers organization in Castletown Bear is bringing the state to court over what it believes is the unconstitutional change in the penalty point system and a group of farmers burned letters from the Department of Agriculture outside the department's offices in Clonakilty this week over a new TB grading system. We also have a Holy Communion's photo special and a look back at last month's flooding as we talk to businesses about how they have fared since. We also have our usual columnists, business and motoring pages and in property we feature a beach chalet in the stunning location of Sheep's Cove just near Ring. There are also details in our farming section of how to enter this year's farming awards and in the life and community section we have Emma Conley's COVID diary and all your usual local notes packed with news from your local area and a super sports section as always. So don't forget if you can't get to the shops you can subscribe online by going to southernstar.ie and clicking on the e-paper tab. Or call the office on 028 for a postal copy to be sent out to you. And now for this week's musical treat. Dipping into our Southern Star Sessions archive of music recorded in recent years, 
star creative manager Niall Driscoll has chosen a track from Clonakilty singer-songwriter Eve Clegg. Eve is from Clonakilty and comes from a very musical background as both her father Les and her brother Sam are accomplished musicians and composers in their own right. The song is taken from her 2019 EP Young Naive Me. This song was recorded in our Skibbereen studio just over a year ago in August 2019 and it's her EP's title track Young Naive Me. For more, see Eve Clegg Music, that's C-L-A-G-U-E, on Facebook. listening to the Southern Stars Coronavirus podcast and don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our podcast which is available on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Acast, Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts.